Theology. Theology Unplugged. Welcome to Theology Unplugged. I'm Michael Patton, and this is episode number 46 of Through Theology in a Year. We are going through all of theology, all of systematic theology in one year. I'm glad you've joined us. Hopefully, you can not only join us, but you can go over to our Patreon, my Patreon, and check it out uh, at Patreon. Uh, I have a, it's just set up in a great way. It's a blog. It's a, it's, uh, you, you get access to all kinds of stuff, all kinds of gifts, all kinds of, you know, theological material from, from courses from uh, Gary Habermas to Doug Grotheis to um, uh, Douglas or Doug, uh, uh, or excuse me, Craig, Craig Blomberg, uh, his New Testament, uh, uh historical reliabilities of the reliability of the new testament which there's nothing better than that with uh blomberg so we had them come out to uh credo house and record those and said listen teach only your seminary level classes and teach the full thing in three days and we really did we had them teach in three days we were filming from morning to night, morning to night, morning to night, three days in a row. They got it done. They were troopers. They sounded just as good on the last ones as they did on the first ones. At least some of them did. You know, some of them were a l- little bit worn out, you could tell. But uh, 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 Mark Hitchcock did a great job on Revelation, and uh, he sounded great throughout the entire thing from chapter one all the way to chapter 20. It was, uh, or 21. It was a, it was a great, great series so all of them are really good you get lots of courses so go over to my patreon check it out you also get the uh theology program which is basically what we're doing here through theology in a year but it's broken up only into 60 sessions rather than how how many sessions i'm doing but they are six or yeah 60 sessions of an hour and a half a piece and so that's really you know 90 uh, 90 hours of uh, this this material and I teach it with my buddy Rome this was a long time ago all the way back 20 over 20 years ago now and uh, it was it was a good time and it still works it's still good uh, it's and it's got workbooks powerpoints everything else so you get those whenever you uh, sign up on the $25 a month deal this is how I support myself so if you're wondering how to support myself I do this full time I prepare for this non-stop i have a couple other podcasts do my blog uh a few other things i do right now uh we're setting up a place called the credo house which is a headquarters for all of all that we're doing headquarters slash coffee shop slash theological museum so help us out the more you help the more it goes towards this stuff i am committed to making theology accessible that is what i am about and that is what this is about here today so we're going to continue today talking about uh we're, we're still in prolegomena of course and we're still talking about traditions how church traditions how we can see the big picture of how church traditions view each other. And we're dealing with the big major three, Protestant, Eastern Orthodoxy, and Roman Catholicism. We've already done Protestantism and Roman Catholicism. Now we're moving on to Eastern Orthodoxy, which is ironically uh, one of the most enigmatic ones that we can we can cover because it's very difficult to help people to understand especially protestants to understand eastern orthodoxy eastern orthodoxy usually is thought of by protestants as just roman catholicism but the other side of the coin or roman catholicism without a pope and Eastern Orthodoxy does not think of themselves that way at all. I mean, they, they're, they're surprised. Any good Eastern Orthodox would be very surprised to think that you think of them that way. As a matter of fact, they would probably see us, Roman Catholics and Protestants, as two sides to the same coin because of a variety of factors. I know that may surprise you, but Eastern Orthodoxy sees themselves very differently than we see them primarily because we just see the same institution or the same kind of tradition that goes through the Roman Catholic Church 
And it's hard for us to distinguish that because we just see the tradition. And we kind of think of it as weird. You know, we've been to, maybe you've been to an Eastern Orthodox church and you've seen the incense and you've listened to the chants and you've listened to the, the, uh, the sermons that are chanted through and it, confuses you and you don't really know how to understand it other than through a view of tradition like Roman Catholicism. Well, we're going to look at this differently. And what I want to do is I want to try to, I, I'm, I'm going to do my best here. This, uh, the first time I've done this and we'll see if it works, but there's a movement out there right now that is being highly criticized. Now, not all of you all are going to criticize it because some of you guys some of you guys may belong to this movement. Some of you guys may empathize with the movement, but many of you may be very far against the movement and see the problems in the movement. I'm not really speaking to the problems one way or another. I'm just speaking to its perception. Now, it's called the NAR, New Apostolic a ref reformation and basically they're calling for a new reformation and as it says new apostolic reformation and in the new apostolic reformation they want to establish a few things and here's some points and you just take this the way you're going to take it okay just just listen okay uh the new apostolic movement is calling for a restoration of the apostles and the prophets Okay, not just apostles and prophets, like uh, the function of apostles and prophets in the church, or really the function of prophets, the function of prophecy in the church, but the function of the office of apostles and prophets. The function of the office to such a degree that we are being called in this movement to have apostles just like they had in the early church. So we should have apostles today. We should have people that have ultimate authority in the church today that everybody else follows and listens to just like they listen to Peter and just like they listen to Paul. That's one point. It is also uh, it also has a theology called Kingdom Dominion theology, and Kingdom Dominion theology basically says that that uh, I think there's seven points of it. There's seven points of the dominion that we are supposed to take over in the world. So we're supposed to that you know we're called to have dominion in Jesus, uh, Genesis chapter chapter three, where uh, God tells us what to do: have dominion over the earth. And if we are called to have dominion, then it's to have dominion over every sphere of earth. So we take over the government, we take over the education, we take over the entertainment, we take over the, uh, you know, I, I don't know what the seven points are. I don't know if I have them written down here, but media, arts, entertainment, family, religion, business, all of these areas, we are to infiltrate. We as Christians are to uh, see ourselves as called by God to take over. And that is whenever the kingdom comes, okay? that's It's kind of a, a kingdom now theology. This is nothing new. I don't want you to think this is anything new. I remember whenever I was, gosh, whenever I was in, in uh, junior high, whenever I was going to a certain school that had a guy that taught this. So it's it's nothing new. It's just being highly more highly criticized, I think because of the advancement of it and because of the 1990s birth of the intellectual charismatic movement. In other words, there was a more robust charismatic movement that came about in the 1990s, more respectful in a lot of ways, uh, and in the 2000s, uh, you know, you got people like Sam Storms, and we'll, we'll talk about these people later, Sam Storms and J.P. Moreland, Wayne Grudem, uh, Craig Keener, great scholars. I mean, some of the best scholars there are in the world, and they're also charismatic. And so this brought some respect to the charismatic movement, which has opened people up to it a whole lot, especially in the Reformed traditions. So you have that as one of the major major hallmarks of this uh, NAR, New Apostolic Reformation. Another point in this, and I'm going to get to my point. Trust me, this 
uh, this has something to do with what we're talking about with Eastern Orthodoxy quite a bit, I think. As a matter of fact, I've written a blog on it last night, late last night, because I saw the kind of connection so much. But uh, another call is that we are to be called to see God, and this is this is part of prophecy, but to really expect prophecy, to expect new revelation, to expect God to be giving us understanding of whether it be the future or what it is that we are supposed to do as a local church or as a church of America. You know, what it is we should expect, what it is we should be pushing for. And whenever you get these prophecies, that is whenever the apostles come in and are able to kind of push it. There's a couple other points like spiritual warfare, uh, but uh, uh, different types of spiritual warfare, but that's the primary thing. And you may look at this and you say, wow, I mean, you're talking about apostles and, and really it's, it's called this father-son theology. Not father, not not in the sense of father, son, holy spirit, but father, son in the sense of, and this is important too, father, son in the sense of the uh, one one authoritative figure you are to put yourself under completely, and he has to have complete authority over you, and this is how the leadership is to function. There are ultimate leaders in the church. They are prophetic leaders. They get words from God. They're able to tell the church what to do, and then there's a father-son mentality in the leadership structure where they are passing on. They are they are uh, uh, overseeing these new leaders that are up and coming. So you, you see all this this stuff and you see kind of some, and, and here here's the criticism, it's a very radical nature. Most people will look at this and say, wow, I mean, I, I can't accept that because, you know, you can't, you'll, you'll have abuse, you'll have absolute abuse within the church whenever you have somebody, I mean, how do we know that? You're you're an apostle, and how do you we know that you're you're called to do this? How do we know that you're called to be over the Church of America and uh, tell us what is going on in the future? How do the, the, it's it's a, always an epistemic issue of how do you know? And so it's like how do you know and abuse? Those are the things we're scared of, and we're really scared of that. Most people are. One of you start to hear somebody that is in ultimate authority within the church getting revelation from God, it starts to sound very cultic. It starts to sound like sometime they're going to be having us drinking some sugar water, you know, some type of flavored sugar water, and we're going to be waiting for a UFO. I mean, who knows? That's that that's the mentality we have because that's the experience we have with other people who have done this. And we have cults that have been built. We have massive cults that are out there right now built upon a guy named Joseph Smith who got his words from the Lord, who acted as an apostle and who had people below him and had a similar leadership structure. It's the authority, the, the, these people that are alive and guiding us to, we, we, we don't mind being guided by the apostles. We don't mind being by, guided by the Bible. We understand that to be established authority, but we don't like it whenever somebody else comes in and claims authority. Now that set aside, because we're going to deal with a charismatic issue, and we'll have some stuff to do with that later on. But that's going to be later on in this prolegomenous section. We're going to have to ask the question, does God still speak today? And so we'll deal with some of that. But the point is, is this, that we are fearful of people coming in and abusing authority, taking authority, and um, uh, uh, not being called by God to do so and leading the church in a really bad direction, leading us in a really bad direction. Okay, set that aside. Take that right now and set that aside just for a moment, okay? Because that's very important for our understanding of the Eastern Orthodox mentality. I think most Protestants will be very sympathetic to this as well as we walk through this. So let's go to uh, the PowerPoint and uh, start going through it just like we did. But no, we're actually going to do it a little bit differently because we got a lot more to cover. But first of all, 
let's let's look at it this way. Uh, you've got the stool once again. Do you remember the stool last time? The stool last time we had the authority, and then we had the three st- uh, legs of authority. You had tradition, you had scripture in Roman Catholicism, but in the middle you had the church, the living authority of the church, the church today, the church as it is alive today. They are the ones who are able to interpret the scripture and tradition that have been handed down. Remember, the apostolic deposit was handed down in two ways, through word of mouth and by letter, so scripture, written scripture, and then the church in the Rome in Roman Catholicism came in and interpreted both. Those are the three legs of authority. So uh, really two legs of revelation, one leg of interpreting that revelation that is alive and well today in the papacy, still talking about Rome, in the papacy and in the magisterium, the congregation of bishops. Okay, now, whenever you're talking about the Eastern Orthodox Church, they do not believe in the living authority, at least in the way that Roman Catholics do, okay? They do not believe that there is the church that is the living authority. You see, they believe, they're sometimes called the church of the seven councils because the Eastern Orthodox believe that the that all of tradition and scripture and the essentials were properly interpreted by uh, the fir- by the seventh century, or by the eighth century, no seventh century. Excuse me, the seventh century. Once the set last council, the last ecumenical council, uh, there's been there was seven great ecumenical councils before the church split in 1054. That's why you'll sometimes hear it called the seven ecumenical councils. Like I said, Roman Catholicism believes in 21, but whenever the church was completely together and you didn't have any splits, there were only seven ecumenical councils that got together the entirety of the church and discussed theological issues and sometimes wrote creeds, sometimes wrote canons, sometimes wrote decrees, but just basically said, here's what the conclusions we have come to. Now, that happened in the first seven centuries of the church. Uh, 687, I think, was the last one. Uh, the seventh ecumenical council, but you had uh, the first ecumenical council, which Protestants agree with. Uh, we we agree that the first council, which defined the Trinity, was correct in its definition, and so then that, that is called the Council of Nicaea, and we are Nicene Christians who believe in the Nicene Creed that was written. Okay, and then there was uh, the 381 kind of update of that. There was um, there were there was another council, and then there was the fourth ecumenical council, which was the council which we call Chalcedon or Chalcedon, as some people put it. But in the Council of Chalcedon, that is where you had the establishment of the person of Christ, who was Christ in his natures. He was 100% God and 100% man. That is the Fourth Ecumenical Council. That's usually where Protestants stop. We agree with the first four ecumenical councils, um, and really primarily with the first, with the additions, and the fourth. But then after that, it kind of goes downhill. Uh, Protestants are usually like, yeah, they it has uh, disparaging input for the church or uh, a disparaging uh, 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 the disparaging influence, a smaller and smaller amount of influence as it goes down. As a matter of fact, the last seventh, seventh ecumenical council, we really don't believe in as Protestants because that established the veneration of icons. So we do not believe in the veneration of icons. We do not believe that icons, and I'm, I'm going to use it in this word, venerated, was sometimes Protestants, we see it as being wor- as these icons being worshipped, and maybe that's proper to say that, but that's just the way Protestants see it, is that it established the worshipping of icons. But the Eastern Orthodox Church believes in the first seven ecumenical councils, 
And those seven ecumenical councils have been established. There has been no council since then. The Eastern Orthodox Church does not believe that there are going to be any more councils. So all of Revelation has been given and interpreted. So it was given by the apostles and it was interpreted within the first few centuries of the church. Done. It's over. There's no more going on. We're just living this out. We're living out what they handed down to us. The tradition that they handed down to us, the traditions that they handed down to us, that is what we are living out. So with that in mind, let's move to this, okay? You got to understand kind of the, the map of the early centuries. This is this is what was established by around the 4th, 5th century. You have the five main bishoprics. These are called bishoprics. Notice here, you have Jerusalem. Um, let's see if I can get my pen up here. You have Jerusalem over here. The black part is the land, of course. Jerusalem, Antioch, Constantinople, Alexandria, and Rome. Those are the five main bishoprics. And what does that mean? Those are kind of the main churches, the big churches of the day. That is, that is the, um, the, uh, the eraser. Let's see here. Erase all that. Is, that is the main churches with the main bishops, the primary bishops. And each one of those bishops ruled over other bishops. And that's the way it was established. That's the way it was early on. And it functioned well in that sense in the early centuries, at least it seemed to the Eastern Orthodox. From the Eastern Orthodox point of view, everything was great, right? Then you have some things that begin to happen. Number one is you have the invasion of Islam in 612. And in 612, as you can see on the map, the Islam was was very, very, uh, uh, their military was was advancing quickly over the empire, oh, toward the west, over the Roman Empire. It was very powerful. It was very vast. It was very grassroots and had, it kind of had a an American Revolution type feel to it because it was such a ragtag group of people that were able to pull this off and do it so quickly against the Roman Empire. But this is what happened. You had the invasion of Islam. And notice here, in the invasion of Islam, you have Antioch, Jerusalem, and Alexandria, those bishoprics now ruled over by Muslims. Now, the Muslims did allow Christians to exist in these areas, but it wasn't the same. It wasn't the same type of power. It wasn't the same type of authority. It wasn't the same type of world that they were ruling over, cities that they were ruling over. Now it was being integrated and infiltrated by Muslims, okay, and Muslim oversight. So basically what it came down to is you just had the two. You had Rome and Constantinople that were left. And in this, you had kind of a division of infighting that began to happen between the East and the West. All throughout the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th centuries, there was just differences, differences in ways of thinking that even made their way into the first seven ecumenical councils and some, some battles that went on there for language and understanding. But between between Rome and Constantinople, the two primary bishoprics that were left, these battles got very, very difficult. You see, Rome was over there. Rome was over here, and they were crowning emperors. In 800, uh, Charlemagne was crowned the Holy Roman Emperor by po the Pope. Well, I think it was Pope Leo the Third. I think it may have been, but um, Pope Leo crowned the Emperor of Rome. I mean, this is crazy. Who 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 gave the Pope the right to crown the Emperor of Rome? Who gave the Pope, the pastor of Rome, the Bishop of Rome, the authority to say who's going to be Emperor or not? So you see kind of this rise in power over with Rome. Rome was always, the bishop of Rome 
who was the who was sitting in the seat of St. Peter, was always thought of as a first among equals. But it was always equals, even with all the five other bishops. They were all thought of as equal. Of, as equal. But Rome really began to exert its authority early on. And by the 4th or the 5th century, began to claim primacy, began to see itself as the prime apostolic apostolic seat, this prime bishopric. And so there was a bunch of battles that go on between Constantinople and Rome. Another one of these battles had to do with just basic language, the way they thought of the Greek, uh, the East spoke Greek, the West spoke Latin. They articulated their theological language different, and it caused some problems. There was another major problem that was interesting that you need to know about in order to understand the change, and that came with the filioque clause, the filioque clause. And I think I've mentioned this before, but the filioque simply means and the son. Now, why is that such a big deal whenever we're talking about Rome and Constantinople, the East and the West? Well, because... From the standpoint of the East, here, here's what happened. Rome came in and added to the Nicene Creed. Remember the ecumenical creed, the creed that was established by everybody? They came in and said, hey, we're going to put in this uh, this word filioque, uh, this word and the son. When we're talking about the Holy Spirit proceeding, we're going to say the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Now, there were two major problems with this from the standpoint of the East. Now, first of all, was a theological problem. They said, no, no, you can't do that, because if you say he proceeds from the Father and the Son, then you are going to lose the distinctiveness in the Trinity. You're going to, you're putting all the Trinity together. They basically accused the West of being modalists, and what that means is that You're seeing God as one God who shows himself in three different ways, not three different persons. And the East had the tendency to focus upon the distinction of persons in the Trinity, while the West has the tendency to focus upon the unity in the Trinity. That's true. I mean, that's true even to this day. It's hard to not favor one person over the other to some degree. And it's hard to keep that balance and that tension, just like all tension in theology, is hard to keep. Well, the East basically looked at this and they said, wait, wait a minute, we we put this in here whenever it said we say that uh, the Son is begotten of the Father and the the, uh, Holy Spirit is sent by the Father, then you have... Uh, you have this distinction. You have the begottenness and the sent. But now you're saying that the Father begets the Son and the Son sends the Spirit, which loses the distinction. I mean, excuse me, the uh, the Father begets the Son and the Holy Spirit is sent by the Father and the Son, which loses the distinction. People are gonna mix up the Trinity and see that there the distinction is not as clear as we had it in the Nicene Creed. I know it's very hard to understand, but at the same time, it's not it's not just that they changed the creed. It's not just a theological issue. It's not just, hey, you're you're acting modalistic. There's there's a whole lot more to it. And it's who do you think you are? That's this is number two with the filioque clause. First one is the theological. Second one is, who do you think you are? You can't just change a creed by yourself, Rome. I mean, you're already crowning emperors over here. You're already trying to tell us what to do half the time. I mean, we're Constantinople. We've got our own bishopric. Let's get together and meet. We're, We're equals. What do you, who do you think you are changing the creed by yourself? You see what I'm saying? Kind of this authority and this arrogance and this preeminence and this this idea that uh, we were, you were, I'm better than the rest of you guys, and you guys have to do what I say. 
Now, this came to a head. I mean, it just got worse and worse. And yes, the, uh, Rome was doing this. Rome was proclaiming its preeminence above the rest of the bishops and basically demanding that the bishops support or the bishops bow down. We talked about this last time. And on Christmas Day, listen to this, on Christmas Day, um, uh, Pope, gosh, who was it? I think it was another Pope Leo. There's been so many Pope Leos, but one of the popes, let's just say Pope Leo. I, I mean, there's, it's not Pope Leo the first. He was, he was part of the, uh, uh, the Chalcedonian creed, but we're going to go ahead and say that, uh, Pope Leo. No, nope, it can't be Pope Clement. I'm just trying to think of the name. Pope Clement was the one who called for the crusades, but anyway, so let's just say Pope Leo, Pope, let's say Pope Leo the second or the third. No, the third would be, uh, let's say the, Let's say the second. I think it might be the second. So Pope Leo the second uh, says, "Let's let's uh, wait a minute." <laughs> Pope Leo the second. Yeah, okay. It doesn't matter. Pope Leo the second sent Cardinal Humbert to Constantinople on Christmas Day. Listen to this. This is great. Great story. Sent Car uh, Cardinal Humbert to Christmas Day. It wasn't really on Christmas Day that he sent him. He was there for you know a week long, two weeks with his with his uh, cohorts, and they were discussing. And he he, he came uh, from the Pope, and he said, "Hey, go make the bishop Michael Serularis submit to me, basically, and tell him if he doesn't submit, there's big trouble coming." And so they go and have a meeting with Michael Serularis and say, "Hey, we're here on behalf of the Pope." And um, we are trying to get you to submit. And for a week long, they met, and the Michael Serulius would have none of it. And finally, um, Cardinal Humbert put the, I think I've already told you guys this story. I love the story, though, so don't listen to it again. But he put the, uh, the uh, he, he goes in on Christmas Day, marches in there whenever Michael Serulius will not submit, will not concede to submitting to the Pope, and places a bull of excommunication on the altar of the very dramatic, I mean, massively dramatic, on the altar of Hagia Sophia, which was uh, that day the biggest church. And and on that day, why, during Mass, during Mass, while they were given the bread and the wine, and just lays it on there and leaves. And then Michael Serularis eventually excommunicates Cardinal Humbert, which they didn't excommunicate each other. Uh, I mean, they they excommunicated each, excommunicated each other. Cardinal Humbert didn't even have the authority to excommunicate. The Pope was dead already. I mean, by the time Cardinal Humbert got there, the Pope had died. So his, his papal bull that he handed Michael Serularis had no authority. But um, anyway, it was very symbolic and caused a split. And um, that, that was just, uh, that's an important story. I want you guys to know. That's why I tell it to you again during this time. I told it to you whenever we were going through with Rome. But at the same time, it's, it's very, very important. It's very, very important for you to remember. In 1054, there was this split. It was a symbolic split. It was a massive split. Yes, it wasn't complete. It wasn't wholesale. I mean, gosh, in 40 years, the uh, Eastern Church is going to be calling to the West saying, hey, come help us, please. You know, the, the Muslims are on their way. As a matter of fact, here's what we have. You have the 1054, the split between the East and the West. And then look at this. Look at the Muslim advancement. You have it up here close to Constantinople, making its way to Constantinople over Antioch, over Jerusalem, but now you have it by 15, uh, 1453, you have it advancing all the way through Constantinople and who is left but Rome. Rome is the singular, single bishop. So it really kind of, uh, that's not ha necessarily how it happened, but the big picture, whenever you're looking at it from a big picture, you can see one of the Muslims come in and Rome is kind of the only one that is left that's not under Muslim occupation, then you can see how it just grew and grew and grew in authority. 
And so here's what's going on. And let me go back to the NAR. The, the Eastern Orthodox Church looks at this situation and they says, who do, you, who do you think you are having a living authority that tells everybody what to do all the time? Now, Eastern Church has the authority of the councils and they were living at the time. So that was a living authority as those count. So they basically have seven actions of a living authority. So they can't complain too much, but basically that living authority ceased. Eastern Orthodoxy does not have a Pope. It does not have a council that can get together and infallibly declare anything. Everything has already been done. So they're a lot like us Protestants in some ways. They just stop at 787, or is it, it's either 687 or 7, maybe it's 787, 787 with the seven, seventh ecumenical council. So they stop there and don't go any further, whereas we stop at the first century with the last apostle. But that's the difference. Us and the East, Eastern Church, agree. We kind of look at Rome ourselves and say, my goodness, you guys think you can still keep on doing the things you're doing. And, you know, all of authority, all of infallibility, all of the apostolic deposit has been given, and the infallibility is over. Okay, we do not, we as Protestants do not believe in the infallibility of the councils. Eastern Church does, though. So that is a difference. So this is kind of the way they see all of history. Whenever they're looking at this, you got to understand Revelation ceased back then with the completion of the seventh council. Now, the interpretation goes on, but at the same time, the Eastern Church continues in their their viewpoint, their philosophy, their understanding, their big picture uh, kind of the way of of approaching theology is very different from the West. They see Protestants and Catholics both as Western minded, thinking you can figure everything out, thinking you can, you know, you can have uh, these black and white deep lines drawn everywhere in your theology, write your systematic theology textbooks and have it all fit perfectly. That's what you guys are doing over there. That's how you guys are similar. We're over here basking in the apophatic theology, the mystery of God, the the unknowability of God, and we're content within that. And therefore, here we go, Tradition defines us. The tradition, not as you see it, not just, not simply as words that have come down to us. Yes, Eastern Orthodox Church believes in the Bible. Yes, they believe in the pronouncements of those first seven ecumenical councils. But their main thing, whenever you're talking about tradition for the Eastern Church, is this. If you were to walk into an Eastern Orthodox Church, you would be overwhelmed they, they would want you to be at least. I, I went to uh, Romania a few times, and Romania is the largest, the, the is it the largest? No, the second largest because uh, Russia has the most Eastern Orthodox, but Romania has the second most Eastern Orthodox. And in Romania, you have all of these churches that we went into, and none of them had seats. You would walk in, and it was just a big, a big uh, uh, cathedral. It was just open, and high ceilings, and pictures of the apostles all above you. A big picture of Christ in every single one of these that you would always be looking up to. And as I talked to the the priest at the Eastern Orthodox Church, I'd say, "Tell me about it. How do you guys do things, and why do you do this the way you do it?" And one of the things is. They, they don't want seats because it's not about listening to a sermon. It's not about getting this word where you understand, you think through, and you figure God out. And they would say, you guys are all about figuring, God's out. It's, uh, figuring God out. It's going to drive you crazy. You can't. Okay, And it doesn't mean Eastern Orthodox people aren't smart. Don't get that. Don't let me make you th- think that because there's a lot of really, really 
good Eastern Orthodox um, defenders of their faith that are out there. You can find them, and you'd be surprised. So I don't want you to think that they're anti-intellectual. They can hold their own. But at the same time, whenever you whenever you go to their into their tradition, they're not all about learning. It's not about you facing uh, the pastor and the pastor opening the Bible and telling you what it means. It's about going through and connecting with the uh, the uh, first the early church connecting with what they did. Whenever you do something in an Eastern Orthodox church today, it is the same thing that they did in the fourth century. And imagine that. I mean, you go in there and this is exactly what the church has been doing for the last 2000 years. The same words on the same day, the same chants, the same sounds they've handed those things down. And it's it's the beauty of it that they want you to see. The high ceilings, they want you to stand in awe because of the majesty of God. They want everything to look like God is infinite and we are finite. They want the, the sanctuary to make you look small and feel small. They want everything about it to contribute to that apophatic nature of who they are. That's why they would see us as very different over here in the West. That's why they would see Roman Catholicism and and Protestantism as two sides to the same coin. Now, yes, they do have apostolic uh, succession, just like the Roman Catholic Church does, where it's passed on and on and on, but not for the same exact reasons. They don't have prophets. They don't have apostles. They don't have infallibility. And whenever they look at Rome and what Rome did, they see it a lot like you may see in the new apostolic reformation, the abuse of authority that caused what happened later on. So what happens? You have the age of the apostles and the advancement, then the councils and the articulation, just like we had before. So everything so far so good. Once the councils are done though, you have abuse and a schism and then something else happened with you guys. It's kind of like that, you know? It's once the schism happened, something went on over there in that schism and the Western church broke into two. Protestants and Catholics. That's kind of the that's just the way they see it and they're the ones who carry on the true church. The uh, the Eastern Orthodox Oh, I don't have the name. It should have had the name on the last slide there for, on the arrow. But the arrow, the arrow there, the straight arrow is the Eastern Orthodox Church. So they see themselves as the true church. Now, having said that, um, they are, generally speaking, they are much more exclusive than today's Roman Catholic Church. In other words, what I mean by this is that it's basically, unless unless you're a real liberal, which they don't have a lot of liberals, but unless you're a liberal Eastern Orthodox Church, someone that doesn't really follow Eastern Orthodoxy, kind of goes off on your own, your own, you don't think anybody outside the Eastern Orthodox Church can be saved because you have what's called the Cyprian Declaration. Outside the church, there is no salvation. St. Cyprian, which he said, which we respect St. Cyprian. We just think he mean, meant something very, very different. But the Eastern Orthodox Church, that's that's one of their guys. That's one of their go-tos in the early church. It's one of the early traditions that's within the, that time period. And so they look to him and say, see, this is established. It can't change. What he said is, if you are outside the visible institution of the church, that's the way they interpret it. We are the church. And if you are outside of it, doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, and how much you love the Lord, you can't be saved. We just hope maybe you won't burn so hot in hell if you're you know, doing well as a Protestant or something like that. But Eastern Orthodoxy is very, very exclusivistic unless you are much more of a liberal-type Eastern Orthodox. Roman Catholicism 
since it has a living authority, changes all the time. <laughs> I, I don't mean to. I don't mean to misrepresent them here. I, I'm trying to play the Eastern Orthodox here, and the Eastern Orthodox doesn't like the Roman Catholic Church. I mean, they're they're getting closer, and they they've been trying to get back together for a long time. They really have, but they just can't come to agreement because of the Pope. The Pope has been the most divisive character in all of church history. I hate to say it, but it, whenever you look at it big picture, that's what it is. He's the guy that keeps on causing all the trouble. And so they can't get back together because of that, because of the living authority. You can't have a living authority. Uh, in the what, what makes you think, like, like when, if you're talking about the NAR, what makes you think you're an apostle? What makes you think you're a prophet? Why should I believe you are? Just because, just because somebody laid their hands on you and somebody that somebody laid their hands on them and somebody laid their hands on them all the way back to an apostle, that means meaningless to us. It doesn't give it any epistemic warrant from a Protestant standpoint. And from an Eastern Orthodox standpoint, there's, there's not any either. It may give you you know, honor as a bishop, but it doesn't give you infallibility or the ability to be infallible as you get together. And in the end, whenever Rome does a, you see from Rome's standpoint, there is no new revelation. It was all given in those two legs, the unwritten tradition and the written tradition. We just interpret it infallibly. But the problem is, an interpretation is new revelation. I mean, it is. That's what that's what the entire book of Hebrews is. The entire book of Hebrews is an interpretation of the Old Testament in light of Christ. Uh, Paul, that's what he spent half of his time doing, is interpreting the Old Testament. And that was new revelation. And so whenever you're talking about Rome saying we do not give new revelation. We are not prophets. We just interpret infallibly. That is prophecy. That is speaking infallibly on behalf of God. Anyway, I digress. We'll get into that more later on. I will repeat myself once again with that when we get into this for a long time talking about authority within the church. But that is a understanding of Protestantism Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy, and hopefully a summing up of all of them to help you see see the interplay, the differences, and the 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 nuances that go into this. It's it's very complicated, and I just wanted to give you a big picture overview so you could see what it looks like high high level. Okay, guys, don't forget, I um. Can we get a Wesleyan quadrilateral? Well, I love Wesleyan quadrilateral, but I add two to his quadrilateral. But we will get there. I promise. That is coming up. Everything is coming up, but that is coming up shortly when we talk about uh, the sources of, uh, of um, our theology. Uh, we got, I'll give you a preview. We got quadrilateral. No, no, no. We got the Lutheran trilateral. And the Wesleyan quadrilateral. So I only have I only add one more, but I have uh, scripture, tradition, reason, experience. But I separate emotion, and you'll have to wait to see why. I think emotion is a very different different source, and I think it's very important as well. But anyway, guys, thank you all for showing up. Please go to my Patreon and become a patron, and. Um, uh, that would be great. I mean, that's the way I support myself. So I appreciate you guys showing up. Also, listen, listen, don't leave. Don't leave. You, if you, you can send me a question wherever you're at. I don't know how to say, send me a question. The best place to send me a question, I'll say, I'll tell you the number one place I will be looking is in my Patreon in the chat. And on Fridays, I answer all your questions. So that's the way we're going about it now. It's not the way we're going to go about it forever. I hope to have different interaction and more interaction as we move forward. It looks like we've got a big audience, so we should be able to have better and better interaction as we go. So, But that's just coming as we grow. 
Share this. Please share this. That's the way to do it. You got to share it. I, I rely too much on hopefully just it's good enough and you guys will share it. But share it. That's that's how the search engines p- pick up on it. Comment. That's another way. Uh, the algorithms in YouTube, the algorithms wherever you're watching it at. YouTube's the best place for you to go. But wherever you're at, share it, like it. If you're on iTunes or if you're on Spotify or wherever, comment give a rating uh if it's if it's bad don't give a rating uh just give a rating if it's good uh but just uh yeah yeah please do that because that's important i forget to tell you everybody that all the time but if you want to if you want me to answer your question the best place is in my patron uh at, at my patreon if you go to my patreon you will, I think you can go to the chat. It's in the chat area, and it's the first one. You'll see it through theology in a year questions. Put your question in there. That's number one. If you can't get it there, you can get me on Facebook, and that's a pretty good way as well. I'll probably see it on Facebook. Otherwise, you'll have to just comment wherever you're at, and I may see it. I don't know. I get so many. There's so many places this is coming to uh, me through, and uh, I don't know if I'll get all the, all the messages. But anyway, thank you guys so much. We will see you tomorrow as we kind of sum this up. You, uh, you got a, we got a surprise coming tomorrow, so I'll see you tomorrow. Theology 